Thank you. We are on cat lids. When we, and this will be mostly on cat lids of the of how to prepare plants for awards and how to grow them. Thank you, Kay, for discrediting the speaker, but we'll keep going. Um, we'll keep going. Um, we'll, um, we'll start off tonight with announcements as we always do. And then Ben Olivares will be speaking on how to prepare our plants for awards and how to grow them to their peak, not just for performance, but for the peak growing to keep them their peak performance. And then we'll do show and tell. Um, and then we'll do um, the opportunity tables that offered by Ben Olivares, our speaker tonight. And we also have plants for sale for those in the room. Uh, we'll continue. Uh, new members, uh, Robin, Jew and Brent uh, Beavers, if you're in the meeting or on Zoom, please feel free to raise your hand and introduce yourself. Not here. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Well, if you are here, thank you for joining the society. Uh, again, yes, plans for sale tonight. Jan Anderson also wanted us to make an announcement to the general member. She has 55 gallon plastic drums, which are great for passive heat reservoirs. It's actually what I use in my greenhouse as well as many other things around the greenhouse. $10 for one barrel, that is a steal. So um, so feel free to contact uh, Jan ASAP if you're interested. Where is she located? Can I use Water. So four left, she's already sold one. Thank you. Uh, another announcement for people in the Bay Area at the end of the month, the Peninsula Orchid Society is having their show in Halloween. Um, so good way if you're not into the spooky stuff, you can at least see spooky orchids. Um, so uh, please support other Bay Area societies and feel free to go to that society as well. Admission is also free. Uh, again, our normal judging is happening in the room. If any of you want to get your plants AOS judged based on our speaking tonight, take them in the back room. If you can't, tomorrow's judging up in Sacramento. Yeah, it's a drive, but they got good judges up there as well. So, as always, remember judging. And remember to join our guidance. Uh, so, again, presenting your plans for judging. Um, tonight's speaker is Ben Oliveros. He's the owner and orchid of, of Orchid Eros on the Big Island. Ben has been hybridizing in, in both species and hybrids in the of uh, in starting 20 years ago in Atlanta and then now in Hawaii on the Big Island. He is some of the best species and also some of the best hybridizers, I think, around in this current era and, and has been doing a lot of line breeding and has gotten hundreds of awards from the AOS and uh, throughout his years and is also the head of the, uh, of the Big Island Judging Center. So with that, I introduce my friend, Ben Oliveros. <laughs> Now. You gotta stop sharing. I'm stopping sharing. Thank you. Um, I don't know anybody that was in the past, but for those that were, you know, it's gonna be a longer recovery. I called all my orchid friends over there, and they're all fine. So we still have exotic orchids in Maui and tropical orchid farm. And anybody else over there that they lived up on the north shore, so they were kind of out of the trouble. Otherwise, you can find your mouse. You get, oh, it's okay. That's what I'm sorry. Yeah, I, was, no, I was actually using the touchpad. Okay, so, so I'm on the east side of the Bay Island and in between Hilo and Hawking National Park. Right, and then the mountain about 1700 feet. So I'm in a perfect intermediate growing. Probably not too dissimilar to you guys. Uh, you may get it's a little bit of me, but I run upper 50s most nights and then lower 80 days. Um, never had a high over 82, but I've gone as low as 42. So I'm just kind of chilly in the mountains. I grow Draculas, so a lot of things that can be grown here. Is there any way that we can focus on our speaker instead of a split screen? Yeah, hang on a moment. We're first going to get him sh get this sharing, and then we'll work backwards from there. Okay, one moment. Bingo. That's what I want to do. Do here. 
And here, here's hoping. Okay, can you see the first slide online, people? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so let me rename this thing. Hold on a second. Um, over here is a good spot, so I'm not blocking anybody's view of the screen, I think. That works for everybody in the room. Otherwise, people over there are going to be seeing my butt or something. Yeah, I'm just going to rename this thing. Let's go to the other side. There you are. Hold on. Okay. Can you see our speaker in one of the windows? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now we just have to figure out how to get it on there. Yeah. Um, well, maybe I can put the slide deck on my computer. What's that? I can put the slide deck on my computer. Well, or you can just, you normally use two monitors. I'll toss into monitors. Yeah, yeah. 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 Move over there. There we are. Yay! We're good. Make sure to get back in the camera view. I do kind of move around a lot, so somebody keep me in, in yeah, line. Yeah, don't where sweat I need it. To be Why don't we turn the lights off? All right. Yeah. So at first, I wasn't going to give this talk to you guys. Um, I was going to give a bike fully Catley a talk, but you've got to come to Sacramento tomorrow if you want to hear that one. So, so come on out and hear that. And this is probably going to end up being a, a two-part series because I can't get through that program in, in one, one short session. Um, this is one I put together kind of during the pandemic. I've mostly only ever given this one via Zoom, so I'm kind of happy to share this one to a live audience. Um, as the chairperson for the Hawaii Judging Region, region for the AOS judges, uh, this is kind of my partial spiel for trying to recruit judges and get people amiable to exhibiting plans for AOS judging. So there's a lot of propaganda in here. Um, if you've got political issues with the AOS, I do too. So we'll just forget all that stuff. Really, the gist of this is... I love exhibiting plants. I like showing off beautiful plants, sharing them with people, um, doing that through getting my plants awarded is one of those ways because I get beautiful photos in the AOS magazine every month. If you do get the Orchids magazine, there's usually at least a half a dozen awards of mine almost every month in there. And you know, that, that gives me a, a, good, a good feeling, good advertising. Um, and I get a professional photographer helping me you know, get my my photos out there. So this is really more about just sharing plants and how we can grow them better to, to get those awards. Anecdotally, this will be a lot of stuff about sports. Um, so the first part of the winning formula is just going to pee. You got to know your competition. So I have databases. Um, the Orchids Pro, which is available to all members of the AOS, and Orchid Wiz are the, the two things you can basically find out any information you need to know about whether the plant that you think is beautiful is even worthy of being a competitor. And part of my sales pitch here is I, I want you to acquire superior plants. Don't just buy a Catley Illuminati. Buy a Catley Illuminati on a pedigree, one that you know is going to be better than the rest. You really want to grow things to their full potential before you exhibit them. So I have a hard time as an ex exhibitor, and I see something beautiful bloom for the first time, and I want to go show it off, and I end up getting an HCC, if, if that. Um, but you wait a few years until that plant's got some heft and some mass, and then everything's bigger, bigger and better with time. And you want to take your plants in camera ready, is what we call it. So if the photographer's not going to be able to get a good picture of it, chances are, even if it's an awardable flower, they're not going to award it. 
because the judges don't want to look like fools when they can't get a good picture and everybody says, why did they award that? <laughs> and this is important both as an exhibitor and as a judge. We got to be good sports about it. I know these are our babies and we get kind of sensitive when people make negative comments, but that's kind of what judging and being judgmental is all about. You're going to hear the good and the bad. Um, so just try to roll with it and be a good sport. Yeah. Important part. I didn't have very many awards at all before I moved to Hawaii. <laughs> we've got great judges there, and we've got a perfect climate. So, as I said before, really, this is all about growing your plants as well as they can possibly be grown. And I'll show you examples of how I've taken mediocre plants and made them showstoppers just by putting a good root system on them. So, why even play the game? So uh, we all come to meetings like this because we want to share our beauty with other people. And with getting awards, um, you know, you get the the benchmarks, you get the the, the ads or the photos in the AOS magazine. Uh, so they're records for the future, so people know what's good and maybe what's not good. We have a great photographer in our region. So if you have a good photographer here for your $35 award, you get a professional photo taken. So that's a pretty good deal. Another reason I like getting awards is when I go to sell a piece of something, I just put another zero on that price tag. <laughs> and last but not least is the AOS needs the money. Uh, they make more money off of awards than they do almost anything else. Uh, the membership is kind of a break even, uh, but the $35 for an award kind of goes straight into their pocket for conservation or whatever else they're doing. And so for those of you that have thought about being a judge, like our young friend Mitch here, who's getting started in it, um, we're supposed to have very altruistic reasons for being a judge, and we want to share our knowledge with people and you know, support the AOS. Um, but of course, there are personal reasons we do this. Um, this is one of my main reasons for getting involved is it was a fast track to learning. You're forced to do research. You're around a lot of people that know more than you do, so you can learn a lot faster. Um, it also helps give you an understanding of just the rules of the game, what makes a plant awardable. And one of the best perks is when you go to shows, you get in before everybody else. So you can shop on Thursday with the judges instead of having to wait for the Friday show open. Or I went to the Tokyo Dome and I got to judge the Tokyo Dome show as an AOS judge. I was in there with 300 people. The next day, I was in there with 200,000 people. So I did my shopping with the 300. Um, We're seeing an orange box that's covering up uh, most of the uh, the slide on the view on the uh, the Zoom screen. Uh, thank you for that. I don't know uh, why it's asking me to give subtitles a try, but uh, somebody can turn that off or turn it on. And that's why you're at it for saying they don't see a full screen to see like. We also have the speaker oh. the screen up, not the presentation screen. Got it. Swap from oh. Oh, better. Can I get something? Do you want to just play settings? And we have it all. We got split screen in there. Subtitles. Subtitles. <laughs> I don't. I don't go by notes. Yeah. He is looking good. Okay. There we go. Looking good to you guys? Yeah. Looking yeah. good. Yeah. Plus, plus, we get subtitles now. All right. I'm going to just have an AI give the rest of this presentation <laughs> to the mic. Okay. So, in the getting the you know the competition, um, you can do a lot of research on your own at home just to know whether you've even got a candidate worthy of taking in. It'll save you some time and some frustration if you're just growing a common Mariclone plant versus growing something that's uh, going to be a, a little little better than the, the rest. Um, you can do easily, if you're an AOS member, a comparison through Orchids Pro and measure your flower at home and see if it compares to what's awarded. 
because that's what we're going to do as judges. So again, we save yourself the gas or the travel time if you know it's not even in the ballpark. And so, as I said before, these are the basically the two things that all the judges are going to be using outside of their knowledge. Work it is which is off the market this year. So um, if you want to use it, you can get it at half price. It will never happen to you up this year. Is, is that confirmed yet? That is confirmed. Okay, because I was told that it may no longer be updated, but it looks like they finally got a buyer to get us updated again. Orchid Wiz is what I love the most, not the, not the Orchids Pro program, um, but I don't use it nearly as much. It's great for the the measurements and the photographs, but working with just gives you an incredible amount of detail for researching hybridizing and all sorts of things. Now, this is a little tidbit if you are an orchid exhibitor uh, that nobody ever tells you. Um, and I didn't learn about this until fairly recently, and an exhibitor kind of pointed it out to me. When you enter a plant for AOS judging, there's a form you're filling out, and it's got a comments section on there that nobody ever uses. That is for the person exhibiting to highlight something that they may want the judges to, to take note of. Uh, because often, if the judges have 30 plants to look at and they're going through them fairly rapidly, they may miss that nuance that you saw while you were spending hours looking at your beauty, and they are you know, just overlooks the thing that really makes it exceptional. And we're looking for the things that make it exceptional. So write it down. Say, hey, this thing has got a bigger lip than anything ever seen before, or uh, the color is different than the rest of the grass, or whatever the case may be. Use that comment section and educate your judges because, um, as I say, sometimes they aren't going to see the same thing you do. And it's worth drawing their attention to it. So in scouting quality, uh, this is where pedigree comes in. Uh, usually, if you start with awarded parents, uh, you've got a better chance of having awarded offspring. Um, and another thing I like to pitch when I sell a lot of small plants is don't buy just one, because mm -hmm. out of a population of 200 from a seed pod, chances are most of them are going to be slightly different. And there are going to be some that are the outliers of that bell curve. And those may be the ones you really want is the true anomalies. So, you know, 99 out of 100 are going to be very similar. So you've got, you've got to buy a few more if you want to get the weird ones. I kind of liked, you know, the, the, the very stable, fast-growing genetic ones at the top. You know, so I'll pick out, you know, the fastest-growing plants that, that look the healthiest and hardiest, but I'll... I'll keep a few of the weird runty ones too, just to get things that might be totally different. Um, this I put into a program for one particular customer I had that would always <laughs> circle my table. I have that, I have that, I have that. And he didn't have any of my plants. He may have had that species, but he didn't have them coming from my line breed. So he really didn't have to. Um, first time I gave this talk, uh, the Q and A part of it, and we're on Zoom. He's got the first question, his face pops up on the screen. Um, so I felt like an idiot, but I haven't heard that from him anymore. <laughs> and now he, he buys parent plants from me because he knows, yeah, maybe I've got a little Mediano, but I don't have his strengths. Lastly, exceptional <laughs> flowers come from exceptional parents. Like, Perfect case is the man's. So, so now I'm going to start showing you guys a, a few pretty pictures and, and kind of what this is all about. So um, Atlea Lutomaniana is a pretty good one, but this is really what you want. Um, I mean, even if you're not into exhibiting plants for, for judging, I think most people would, would want to have that in their greenhouse uh, with or without an AM on it. This is kind of showing where line breeding has come and, um, you know, why you want to buy plants that kind of have come from pedigree and furthering uh, line breeding. Umbine was the very first Persimiliana cerulea to, to ever hit the U.S. Uh, maybe 25, 30 years ago. And you really can't even see the cerulea in it, but it's, it's a cerulea, but just a super ugly flower. Um, 
you know, poor shape, um, small size, and basically from selfing, sieve crossing, all starting with this plant, this is what we have now. Uh, this is maybe three generations away and, and just absolutely spectacularly improved over where we started. Is that a four end? Uh, there's still two in. Really? Yeah. That's probably the best I've ever seen. And I, I bought it as a seedling from Armando Mantellini, who's the guy that brought this into the U.S. and is kind of most renowned for breeding Venezuelan species. But he knew what he was doing. Here's a good example for your question, 2N versus 4N. This is where we used to be with Catlia clandy eyes and 2N uh, HCC from 25 years ago. This is where we are nowadays. So this is a 4N version. Everything's twice as good. And it's not to discount the, the beauty and, and grace of a 2N plant, but you never get anything like that awarded again. Not now that these are being exhibited. It's in that kind of a, a cuppy version. Uh, I mean, uh, They're all a little bit cuppy to a degree. But you know. the, one, the, the one on the left, has, I think it's more, I mean, they're not wider petals, but they're flatter. flatter. Yeah, yeah, it is flatter. Well, that's why this isn't an FCC, I think. It's just cuppy that it's you know, absolutely gigantic. It's, I will say that. <laughs> um, this is a case of do you buy a bunch of seedlings and hope to get a good one, or do you just go ahead and pay somebody to get a good one? I bought a whole bunch of Prey Stands con colors from the Brazilians when they first started coming in. Me and Peter Lynn bought everything they had every time they'd come in. And after a while, I finally got an AM on one. Um, then I went down to Brazil and I saw one that was a hundred times better than anything that I had bought out of the 30 or 40 I already had. So I bought another one and I got an FCC on it, but I probably paid more for this one plant than I did 40 or 50. Years. So do you, do you just go ahead and buy the award or do you play the lottery? They're both fun. So when you're selecting seedlings, um, there are tricks of the trade. Um, some people will share with you. Some people like to keep secrets. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what I do. Uh, I basically select from just the whole plant itself, even before I ever see a flower. And I want thick foliage, round leaves, fat roots. These are all the kind of things tell me I might have a tetraploid. Um, and it's kind of an adage amongst the old timers that, you know, the rounder the leaves are, the better chance you're going to have a fuller flower. Um, I've been in places like Carter and Holmes that have been around for, you know, 60, 70 years, and their entire stud collection is filled with patterns. Every single leaf in that house is round and fat and uh, the quality of their plants kind of shows maybe that selection process is true because they've, they've had amazing renowned plants for decades. And so I was saying, I start picking them out just as foliage plants. I'll start while they're in flask. I know uh, Bob Hamilton, somebody that's around here, and we talked about how he does this by looking at the bottom of the jar and looking for fat roots in there. Um, as soon as I take them out, you know, I'll start feeling leaves and setting stuff aside, even as, you know, a two inch size plant. Um, and they get selected all along the way. And then another thing that's kind of hard for me to do because I'm commercial in this. So I've got to call the herd quickly to make room for more coming through. But uh, don't throw the baby out with the bath water it's the first time you see it flower because things do improve with time. I'm going to show you some, some pictures that will show that. And then you can visually look for flowering things uh, in fine tetraploids. This was a clone. Um, this was the thing that was cloned. And as I was growing out too many of them, I started seeing a few sports pop up like that. So. It was a clonal mutation. I got some tetraploids out of the batch. Um, so that was something that was easy to see when you had a population on the bench that this is not like the rest. 
and I started seeing other plants once I saw this one where I could tell the plants themselves were different and I picked out a few more of the, the tetraploid sports. So saying, you know, don't make a decision necessarily on the first flower. Uh, you want to grow them up to maturity and really see what they're going to do. Um, like with bifoliates in particular, if you're growing amethystoglosses, you're never going to see the potential of an amethystoglossa until you've bloomed it for a decade. Uh, you know, I, I've got plants of maybe three feet, three and a half feet tall, you know, 15 years old, and now they look like they should. Um, they were blooming 10 years ago, but not like they bloom now. Um, and kind of the larger and bigger your plants get, uh, the more of a wow factor you're going to get when it goes to a judging table. Uh, I'll show you some, some examples of that. As you're flowering a plant, particularly with cattleyas, um, I find if you don't obsessively repot them and you let one growth come out of the pot, that's usually going to be the best, strongest flower you're going to get before you repot it and set it back to make it start over again. So I try to let my plants grow outside of the pot at least one leaf get a lot of roots down into the air, and then get a really strong flowering out of them. And then evaluate several times. Um, is there are things like coccinias that change from one blooming to another. I mean, amethystoglosses too. They're not always consistent in blooming. And then also getting it to the judging table, the timing is everything. Um, with cattleyas, you've got a few days oftentimes to get them in in prime condition. You know, some things don't need to give you that much time. So uh, you got you to gotta be patient and not jump the gun and take it in before flowers are hardened off or uh, over the hill. So I was talking about earlier growing a plant bigger and better. So this is the exact same plant with different flowerings. The first time I took it in on the, the first flowered and seedling, uh, it was a, a nice big flower, so it got an HCC, but they were really pretty wonky. Um, four years later, I think it was, you wouldn't even believe these were the same flowers. The plant had a lot more mass, it had an incredible root system by then, so it just gave more detergent to everything. Uh, the flowers weren't nearly as floppy as they were on a, a small plant. It now was up to like 11 flowers on one stem, which is, gets to be kind of unheard of with, with Schillerianas. Um, so just by growing something bigger and longer and better, um, it totally changed the look of the flower itself. And, and this is just flowers changing based on maturity. Um, this was seen in a show with only a single flower open and it got an ACC before the flower was even fully matured and hardened off. Uh, so the next year when the flowers had time to fully expand, you know, it took about three days from the time a bud pops to really having a flower that has grown another centimeter and colored up and gotten to be what it should be. So it got elevated to an AM on a much better blooming. And that was just needing to exhibit it at the right time. Another scenario of a plant and a flower changing almost remarkably from one blooming to a next just based on the maturity of the plant. This had two flowers uh, when it was first awarded. And going back in again, it's like the petals seem to elongate, or these are kind of rolling back a bit, I think. Uh, but four flowers on a stem, that gets you more points. Everything improved with time. So this was why I say patience, don't jump the gun and take it in too early, unless you like spending $35, because I do that repeatedly. Uh, this is a case of the wow factor. It was a nice specimen plant. It was worthy of a cultural award, which is what the CCE is, Certificate of Cultural Excellence. Um, it was not worthy of an AM, but it just had so many flowers they couldn't help themselves but give it an AM too. Um, yeah, I, I'll take it, but you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily breed with this for uh, flower form. It was just grew like a weed, which is a great thing. 
And again, a case of having a big specimen plant taken and put in front of the judges helped, helped to get an AM as well. Uh, if I would have exhibited this with just one spike on it, I might have gotten an HCC. Um, and it really shouldn't matter between an AM or an HCC on how many flowers it has on a specimen, but the wild factor works. Uh, this is a maxima that was grown to its, its fullest potential, 16 flowers on a stem, which was hardly ever seen. So maximas are always pretty cuppy, so you're going to get points off for that, but you put a lot of flowers on them with good bright color, and you get something more than it. I mentioned flowers changing from one to another. I didn't have good examples of Sopranitis doing that, but this is something I see in uh, the Clandy eyes, where sometimes these flowers don't have this little modeling and barring in the flower. They'll just be solid black. Um, and I think it's probably temperature dependent, maybe light dependent, maybe a combination of the two. Um, but when these got awarded, they, they had the almost coalescing spots to give you a black flower, but Sometimes they do bloom entirely black. And it's just from one flowering to the next. We talked about amethystoglosses and needing to grow them up before you take them in. This was probably the third or fourth flowering already. So I got excited that I had like eight flowers on it. But when they compared it to other amethystoglosses, it's easy. Not enough blooms. Okay, I'll grow them a little longer, but. 12, 15 flowers. Now I'm getting into AM territory. And that, that stem is a lot more spectacular to look at without the all the gaps when you get a huge cluster like that. Another case of kind of getting a, a give me AM because the plant was just grown to absolute perfection. Uh, they were actually skeptical of this being a Lorenzianum because they're usually Lorenzianums are usually plants maybe 16 inches and poorly grown with wimpy flowers. And this is almost a two and a half foot tall plant that just had these enormous spikes. So some of the judges were like, this can't be Lorenzianum. It's too good. Too big. Like, well, I got this from the source. Uh, I knew it to be what it was. It was just growing beautifully, which makes all the difference in the world. Um, some more things that were kind of astounding to me award wise and you know this I ended up getting voided as an HCC on the left um, just a beautiful flower uh, but there were some issues with the judges and the the score sheets that uh, led that to be voided which I was happy of because I thought it was better than an HCC um, the one on the right is I had heard from Laura Duke when she entered this award. Why is that not an SEC then? I said, well, because I took it in with one flower, which was a fatal mistake. And because it's one of the best and biggest and brightest ever seen, but uh, one flower is not enough. And sometimes judges get overzealous, especially if they've never seen something before. Um, they can either err on the side of caution or Throw caution to the wind like they did this one. Now, this was the very first Elongata Alba that had ever been seen in the US. And they scored it an FCC, um, which has happened in the past with things like half or mediocum that turned out to be like the very worst of the bunch. But this still holds up to be one of the best Elongatas ever. It's better than any of the Tipos ever seen. And still nobody has seen another Alba, I don't think. I wouldn't have given it an FCC as a judge, but I'll take it. When I was talking about timing to get something in, it took me over a decade to be able to get this to the judges. Uh, it blooms at the same time every year. In my pocket more silence. Um, I moved from Atlanta with this. I've been growing it in Atlanta for years and never got it to judging there. And another six to eight years in Hawaii before it ever timed right to get it into judging. My all time favorite cat. Um, little Mike is made up of uh, Memoria Helen Brown and Catlia Bicon. 
Um, so little Mike is about three feet tall with flowers that are, you know, I don't know, six and a half, seven inches, enormous flowers, and you can get up to 10 of them on a spike. So that is just a showstopper, particularly this white fringe around the lip. As you'll, as you want to find out, or you will find out when you come to Sacramento tomorrow, Catley bicolor is my very favorite species. So anything that's got it in the background, I just love. I love these lips. Uh, this is a case of, for many judges, bigger being better. Um, it's the only quantifiable thing judges have to, to do, really. Um, as much as we say judging is an objective process, the only objective thing really is measurements. And the rest of it is up to the personalities and the opinions and everything else that go with the judges. So they can at least measure. Uh, first measurement when I took this Delosa in got me an AM. Uh, I think there were four flowers. You can only see three on here at the time. I took it back in with eight blooms on one stem, which had never been seen. This type of breeding is usually three or four flowers, so I doubled the amount of flowers ever seen, and these individual flowers increased by a centimeter and a half on, on their, their width, and the segments were like a half centimeter bigger. So just by growing this plant up into something that was a much better grown plant, everything improved overall. Um, yeah. Okay, the size of the flower, the quantity of the flowers, these are objectable things or objectifiable things that got me enough points to put it in the FCC category. This is one of the few things you're going to get to see in this talk that is not Catlia. Uh, I don't grow many of them, uh, but I got a CCM on this the day my middle child was born. I got picked out of the hospital for being obtrusive. Uh, so I went to judging that night. Uh, and took this plan in and named it for the, the, the second son, Gabriel Lamaru, uh, which was a CC out on the Rangers Modesta. I got an HCC at the same time. A decade later, I took it back in for judging again on his birthday. Uh, I didn't want to be at the party. And I got a CCE and I won the Hillerman Award, which is the best in great void of the year. But you see, 10 years later, it's got a few more flowers than it did before. And I never repotted this thing. Um, one lesson, hopefully I'll get into it sometime here before I run out of time is the key to success for me is a root system. I really try not to disturb roots as much as possible. I want to grow roots to perfection and everything else is going to follow if you can do that. Uh, so from the decade prior to this, that pot kind of fell over on the bench. Uh, the roots just encircled the pot and just started growing all over the bench and all over its neighboring plants. And I just let it be because it was a happy camper. Um, and it's still an amazing specimen today. Um, if I would have repotted the same grapevoid at any point in time, it probably would have died because they do not like being disturbed. Um, Catley, as you can disturb a little more readily, um, but you don't necessarily want to with many of them. So I love this definition of grooming. Uh, to build a relationship for exploitation. So this doesn't apply to plants necessarily, but I don't like grooming plants. I rarely stake things. I want to just bring them in as nature intended. Judges hate them. They want you to stake them up and have them ready to, to have a good photograph. Um, I'm kind of a naturalist and Really, I just grab plants off the benches. I take them into judging, and I don't spend a lot of time prepping them for judging. So, if you want to get a few more points, clean your plants up, stake them, do all the things you know you should. You definitely want to keep your pests and diseases away. And if you really want to know how to groom plants, get a talk from Keith Davis. He is the master, and he gives a presentation just on grooming plants for orchid exhibition. I think a lot of the stuff he does is not really allowed by the AOS, but uh, <laughs> that's a, you just take all that stuff off before you take it into judging. So this is what I want. I want plants that groom themselves. This is the works of Ixii, unstake, this big, you know, finger thick inflorescence. You don't have to do anything to flowers present themselves all beautifully. 
I finally started getting bicolor awards when I bothered to stake them because once you get this many flowers on the bicolate, the stakes, the spikes just tend to break under the weight of so many flowers. So, so these are about the only thing I really bother with for bicolates because I don't like seeing my fluorescences bend under their own weight. I get cultural awards on things that just make me angry because I don't want to get cultural awards. Like, you know, you can see all the moss and algae and everything else on this plant. It's like, I did not groom this thing for culture. Uh, they want beautiful plants generally for cultural awards and not things that you just grab off the bench. But it was a Dormaniana that had a lot of flowers. So I had to pay 35 bucks for somebody to tell me I know how to grow a plant. <laughs> um, and kind of questions, do you groom or not groom? Um, some plants like this Miller eye, if I would have staked them so they were completely upright and vertical, maybe it would have looked a little better, but mm -hmm. I kind of appreciate both of these doing just what they are kind of naturally doing. Um, I like this. So, so when you're transporting plants like that, how do you make sure they don't break through? Yeah, I may stick them on the way to judging. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah for transport, because bounce. I'm I'm also in the country in Hawaii, so I'm yeah. bouncing down the country roads, mm -hmm. and yeah, even with apparatus and staking, things can just fall apart in transit. I don't even try taking Dracula's in anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for your sportsmanlike conduct portion of this. You know, just remember, judges are people too. Uh, we have our bad days. Um, we get hungry. Uh, things things happen on a daily basis. Uh, I see it every time I go to a judging session. Usually, the plants that are safe for towards the end are the least likely to ever get awarded because people are hungry and grouchy by then. Uh, I just threw a tantrum with our judges this past session because of that. Uh, they, they did no research on my plant, uh, not even looking at the parentage because it was time to go. Should we take them food? Snack? Yeah. Well, that's what I'm doing nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to cut me off? No. Okay. Um, yeah, let me know when it's time. I'm trying to keep a watch on my watch. Or keep a, yeah, keep a watch on my watch, but uh, I can get a little enthusiastic and carry on too long. Uh, but I think we're getting to the nitty gritty where maybe a little more entertaining. Um, this is one thing that kind of bothers me is oftentimes you've got three judges which make a minimum team and that's all you've got to judge the plants. Um, and that's three people making a national decision. Uh, so for our judging, I generally like doing it as a judging on hold. Get every one of our judges involved, um, which has its problems when you need a reserve team. So if you don't have enough people to make up another team, that can get complicated. But I'd re really rather see five, seven, some greater quantity of, of people weighing in with their opinions before they make something that's going to be a, an AOS national decision. Um, so there's that. And this is one thing as an exhibitor when I take off my judge's hat is we've got a handbook for the judges and all the rules we have to follow, but nowhere in that handbook is there an exhibitor's bill of rights. Um, so someday uh, I'm gonna get this through. I'm, I'm getting saluted with one finger by the AOS so far, um, <laughs> but I really think exhibitors ought to have some say so in this. Like, hey, hey, you thought your plant was worthy of an FCC and you got 75 points. Maybe you ought to be able to not pay for that award because you don't think it was worth it. But as the rules stand, if you get an award, you have to pay for it. And if you don't pay for it, you can't get any more awards. Um, they're just little things like that that I'd like to see exhibitors have some say. Um, so you get an, you get an HCC mm -hmm. and it goes up to an AM or an FCC. You got to pay another thirty five dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. Oh. And and even if it goes from say an eighty point AM and they give you uh, eighty eight points next time, you're paying for it again. That's how the AOS is making. Yeah. Um, 
so this is something I put in there for a couple of exhibitors that, that I've encountered through the years. Is it's really best to keep your comments to yourself and until the end. Um, and if you can keep them to yourself, just in general, it's better not to have judges uh, on your bad side. I mean, we're we're supposed to be objective and rational and cool, but if you've made all the judges hate you, chances are your plants might not get fair shakes. Um, we're people, you know. You're gonna you're gonna hold a grudge. Um, it's just nature. So try to be nice. The bottom, be nice. So for cultural tips, um, this article by Bill Rogerson, I keep forgetting to throw the name of the article in the, this program, but it's been published at least once in ORCIDS. It's been published a couple of times in ORCIDS Digest. It's online, but look for an article by Bill Rogerson um, on Catlia culture. And the best part of it is he gives a chart for when to recon things based on exactly what month of the year the plants are putting out roots. So he's charted it out as plants that um, root before they flower or after they flower. So this is kind of a significant thing that nobody had really documented before. The people used to go by the rule of thumb, all cattleyas should be repotted or all orchids should be repotted right after they bloom. And many of them do root after they bloom, but there are a lot of them that root before they flower. Bifoliates, by and large, will root before they flower. Um, so if you're repotting a bifoliate after it's bloomed, you've probably just killed that plant or set it back for several years. Uh, so I basically repot as soon as I see green root tips showing. And that's like my one or two week window that I handle many plants. The bifoliate cattleyas, if I miss about a two week window of when they're actively growing with fresh roots, I don't touch them that year because I killed too many by doing that. Um, your unifolate cattleyas, your hybrid cattleyas, you can repot them out of season. They're going to be a whole lot happier if you handle them just when they're throwing out new roots. Um, I use a lot of different potting methods uh, for growing a good root system. If I've got anything over here that we take a look as you pass by, but You'll find with a lot of these things, I've got like a little two inch net pot. I didn't disturb this plant at all. I set that net pot into a larger size net pot. So it's got old bark in there. Okay, the old bark's gonna you know, turn south and sour at some point. But by then the plant has grown beyond that little two inch pot. And then even with this five or four inch that I've got it in, you know, I've, I'm, I'm loving net pots these days. I've just set it down inside of a harder pot to, to hold a little more moisture, keep it from drying out as fast. But that's what I want a root system to look like. If I had put this plant into this uh, harder pot rather than the net, so it had bark filling this entire thing, I guarantee you this will not have that many roots. Half of these will be dead by now. So I love the nets, um, but I also don't love the nets like consuming my benches and all the plants around them. So I just slip the nets into another pot. So at least helps keep the plant contained a little bit. And now if I'm going to repot this, I'm not going to tear every root off of this and tear all the bark off of this plant and get it out of this net pot, which so many growers would do. I've got a happy root system right here. It's going to go into a six inch pot and I may not even do anything else. May wedge something around it to hold it in place. But I've gotten really lazy about my potting these days on bigger plants where I'll just set them in something larger, stick something in there as a wedge just to keep it from flopping around. And without any media around the root system, there's nothing to cause decay. So when, when plants are grown, you know, like a vanda in a, a basket or a, a cattleya just in an empty pot, I will never see dead roots because there's nothing to cause a dead root. Um, so you so, don't kill the old pot to... Uh, you just leave it. I just leave all that alone. And eventually this stuff is going to be no good. Right. The plant's going to be four or five inches away from there by then. So mm -hmm. 
At some point, I'm going to chop off the front off the plant and throw the back away just to try to get it back to a manageable size plant again. Um, but by and large, I really, really, really try to not damage roots um, and, and not damage them out of season. And I think that's, that's if anything, to take away from this, that's it. Um, observing winter rest for plants is often critical. A lot of the things in nature are not getting watered in nature. It's a, a little bit of research on Orchid Wiz or online um, can tell you that it's like, and I can't tell you how many people, including myself, have killed Dalianas uh, by watering them, watering them in the winter. Violacea is another one. You water them when you're cold, you can kiss them goodbye because they're going to get a, a rotten rhizome and they're just going to go away. I find that with them, with bifoliates, if you just desiccate them during the cold, they may shrivel up, but they're not going to rot and die. I haven't killed a Dalyana in years, um, and I used to kill 50% of them every year. Uh, so they, they get shut off from watering about now, and they don't get touched with water again until after Valentine's Day or maybe end of March. I may pity them on occasion and give them a real quick misting of the foliage, but I never get the root system wet or the, the media wet. Me and other growers have kind of come up with this being the method to grow in Catlia dalianas and Orias and Rositas, because most people kill them. And it's just, in nature, they don't get the winter rest, but something about being stuck in a pot in a greenhouse and in captivation and cultivation, um, they, they die. If you if you can neglect things in the winter, you'll stand a much better chance of keeping them alive. Uh, I dry out anseps and walkerianas. Um, uh, that was a point for you don't necessarily want to grow cattleyas all under the same light. And I found things like pumulas, prey stands, and eyes. I can grow these in obsidian quality light, which is like two thousand foot candles instead of four, and they perform and bloom much better. Anseps and Walkerianas, I can push to nine or eight, okay. nine thousand foot candles and they'll they'll look okay. better. Yes, sir. Uh, how's the winter like in Hawaii? Like you say you don't water in winter. How um, humid is the greenhouse? Yeah. Well, we're we're wet. Um you know, winter's generally our our rainy season, which is like the worst time for being wet, right? Mm -hmm. Um so I all my greenhouses are basically just plastic covering for my plants. I'm just trying to keep rain off. Is it humid? So we're 70% we're humidity almost all year round. So it's constant humidity, but we get constant airflow. So, you know, it's it's not wholly dissimilar to bay growing. Um, so we've got 15 mile an hour winds all the time, high humidity, kind of cool conditions, at least where I am in the mountains. But when I drop below 55 degrees, I just know there are some plants that are intolerant of that. Catlia um, violaceas are one of my favorite to grow and favorite to kill. Um, <laughs> but I just love them so much, I got to keep killing them until I quit watering them in the winter and hell, they don't die. They look like hell and they'll shrivel up and turn yellow. But within a month or six weeks of starting to water them again, everything's pumped back up and they're green. And blooming and thriving. So I'd rather have something shrivel and suffer than to just get a bacteria and go away entirely. Um, so lastly, fertilizers are another way you can, you know, increase flower production. You definitely want to use calcium and magnesium based fertilizers if you don't have it in the water you're using. Um, a lot of the literature over the past 15, 20 years tells people not to use urea or ammoniacal nitrogen. Um, but the old timers that were using the mere acid 301010, which was primarily urea based, they got bigger flowers. They got longer inflorescences. Um, so they don't. This, this types of fertilizer or that type of nitrogen doesn't make the hardiest plant, but it does make better flowers. Um, so if you're just growing for for the flower quality and not necessarily wanting to have you know the hardiest plant in the world, you know, I'm I'm 
not opposed to using urea-based nitrogens. Um, the nitrate nitrogens just give you a much more uh, sturdy plant and cell structure in the plant, but um, they tend to shorten the shorten flower spikes and have smaller flowers oftentimes. Um, this I didn't have a picture for you on how a plant improves by moving it to lower light, but uh, something Alan Koch told me to do. I was typically getting two or three flowers at best on the McClandy eye, and Alan said, ah, just put them under your bench and see what happens. I wasn't going to put them under the bench, but I moved them back into the oncidium light area, and this plant that had an AM with two flowers on the two spikes, I was putting five blossoms on a single inflorescence, which is unheard of with the um, This was a scenario of keeping a plant alive by giving it a winter rest. By Alasius rule is I filled a whole bunch of before I ever started keeping those alive. This is just a pretty picture section for you guys, but um, this was kind of out of the timing as everything. I exhibited this thing pretty shortly after the flower had opened up and it was just spectacular. Two days later, those petals were back here almost catching each other. I was like, oh. people started asking me for the visions of this. And I was like, yeah, you don't really want that plant. <laughs> it was 88 points at the time I exhibited it. It was beautiful that day, but, uh, but not overall. Tony uh, Catley, my color is my favorite species. I've got a ton of awards to this, but um, this is kind of a man made Catley of eye color. You don't find this color out in nature. Uh, I've read a green and a brown together to get this kind of olive strain that sort of improved both parents to me. Um, oh, well, it's for staking or something. I put that slide in. Um, I don't think I mentioned. Uh, what, what, uh, well, maybe I didn't mention what I call pot mounting when I said I just take something like this and stick it in a larger pot and wedge it in there. That's what I would call pot mounting. I'm not using any media, it's just like growing it mounted on a piece of slab or something. Um, but you, you can contain a little more moisture that way. And for somebody like me that likes making divisions of my plants, if I've got them mounted in a pot, uh, I can cut them up a lot easier than I can. You know, saw a piece of wood in half. So I do what I call pot melting oftentimes for things like uh, shillerianas that really don't want their roots disturbed. Um, if you keep them mounted, it's a much easier way not to disturb them and not to have media go south. This was, that was and still is, I think, the most expensive plant I ever bought. <clears throat> bought a 10 bulb division from Brazil that rapidly rotted down to two bulbs. <laughs> um, this was, you know, nearly a five-figure plant down to two scrawny little bulbs um, that I was able to bring back to life. Um, it basically rotted away because it was disturbed in Brazil when it wanted to be dormant. And he bare-rooted it and sent it to the U.S., which is often the case for you guys. If you buy South American plants, just expect they're changing hemispheres. They've been bare rooted. They're going to sulk for a couple of years until they figure out where the heck they are. Um, I find they usually just sit on my bench for two years before they say, hey, it's summer here. It should have been winter, but it's summer. Um, so, anyway, this one brought it back to life. I got an AM on it, something never seen in the US before. But uh, Shillerianas are basically a do not disturb kind of plant. And I was given the countdown a moment ago, and that's uh, kind of where we're ending here. I'm just going to show you how growing things really well uh, can, can add the garnering the, the big awards. So, Bertha Isabel would be my wife. She gets most of the FCCs. Sebastian Farrell is the firstborn son. Um, this is the four end kind of tigrinas that are just super chunky. Leopoldi eyes or tigrinas. Unfortunately, this photo doesn't show the, the flaring as it should, but this is a, a really beautiful flared Walkeriana. And I think the size pushed it into the FCC. 
line because it was you know, almost 13 centimeters, really large walker yana. Mm -hmm. This horse of Wixii was maybe a, a little too many points, but I'll take it. But beautiful, beautiful head of flowers. And you don't see these every day. This is one of my latest FCCs. It's probably one of the best works of Vixie eyes I've ever seen. This is a Colombian seedling that I feel like I won the lottery on. Uh, it was not a cheap seedling, but um, had to buy a bunch of them to get the good one. Um, this was one of my favorite FCCs, and this was a plant that became virus in my collection, which was heartbreaking. But this is why you should share your plants with people. I had a friend with the backup of this, and his was still clean. So I got a division of my plant back from another source after I had to throw mine in the trash. So always share your good stuff. Really, before I ever sell a good division, I give it away to somebody. So I've got Bill Rogerson in Chicago and Dave off in New Jersey, and they get they get the first of anything I've got. And they both have this one because if I ever kill this in my collection, somebody's got to have it. Oh. Uh, finest Aliana I've ever seen. This really saturated color, as nice as you see in this photograph. Um, Cupping just like all Dalianas, but incredibly um, solid subs subs uh, substantive plant. Um, I think maybe a chance to have to And then in one year, I was able to get four. So this one was for the best um, Brassavola. This was the best Catlia. This was the best FCC of the year, maybe. Maybe I didn't show the other one, but oh yeah, I had um Dracula in there somewhere. Yeah, I got four of the national awards, and that came with over two thousand dollars in paychecks from the AOS. So that almost paid for my award fees that year. <laughs> <laughs> this is my usually over two thousand dollars in advertising budget that I spend on awards. This is an FCC show field Deanna, just a big beautiful thing. I think that's another one that's in virus heaven now. Oh, well. And I've got one of these on the uh, rack of table over here. I don't do very much outside of, of the Catlias, um, but my wife is Peruvian. This is my favorite Peruvian species, so I grow these for her. Um, and I, I got an FCC. I, just a couple of years ago on one, I got an AQ on the entire Grex. So I've kind of taken this to mission accomplished. I've got Signochi Scooper eyes as good as they're going to get. So this was the AQ. I was able to have both the male and the female flowers exhibited at the same time. And these flowers do not last. So this was one of those just timing was everything and perfect. Um, Probably the word I'm most proud of out of all the results. Right. There's the bracket at yeah, the FCC. Um, this was a plant I killed three or four times before I ever got, got it to grow. I kept bringing it in from Equigenera and <laughs> killing it again. <laughs> but it's my favorite. Beautiful Xanthotic. And Mr. Leathers here is the one that introduced me to these cursed man. <laughs> My son that I've gotten into orchids at 14, he exhibited his first plant this year. This was his first exhibition. FCC. Wow. Uh, just an incredible sanguinea, probably the largest of any sanguinea type purpurata shown. Yeah, not quite the best photograph because we have trouble with purple on our cameras, but um yeah, that was a good place to start. His second award was an HCC, and he named it Nowhere to Go But Up. <laughs> <laughs> My friends told him there's nowhere to go but down after this. We'll probably never get enough. <laughs> right. I think that was it. Oh, it's one one HCC. Not, not to leave my little girl out. Isabel Rosalie would be my daughter. So uh, most, most of the good stuff gets named after wife and kids. <laughs> They're they're the good stuff too. <laughs> so is your son committed now? Is he 
He's been coming to all the shows with me and he's loving it. So yeah, hopefully I've got the next generation on the hook. It's, it's hard to do. But it's, and you know, he may go away like most kids do, but once you once you've grown up with plants, it's in your way. I mean, I I was growing a African violets and sticks. Yeah. And I never thought I'd be doing this for a living. But I couldn't get it out of my system. I never will I'll be doing this forever. And our photography. Any questions? Anarchy, anarchy. I love the <laughs> subtitles. So you say the key is a good root system. So what are the root system tips? Well, mostly only repot during active root um, That's root tip number one. My fertilizer regimen definitely helps roots. Um, I use a good bit of uh, developing my programs to get me cytokine and something like that. Um, Never been big on Super Thrive. A lot of people swear by that good thing to roots didn't work. But um, yeah, throwing throwing other ingredients at the roots, I think, is a, is a good thing. Like really after a big repotting session, I like using the to kelp. So I'll even use um you know, something I agree with Alan Koch on is using uh, peroxide after breaking a lot of roots and, and just kind of scaling the damage done and getting them to bifurcate instead of rot. Um, so if, if you've got a small quantity of plants or, you know, like for him, he was saying if he repots and then break, and then break them, you can kiss them goodbye most of the time, but if he douses it with a bottle of peroxide, uh, he finds that, that he doesn't have the roots wither away and not hanging against the plant. Um, so for sensitive stuff, I think peroxide may be a good thing. Are you saying like undiluted? He, he goes with undiluted. I actually find a variety that's like super concentrated, you know, thirty-three percent. Um, so I, I definitely dilute that. So that's diluted through a fertilizing injector. So um, I'm a pro that's got pro gear, so you know, most things I can fumigate with or inject into the fertilizer. A little harder to do with water and can what I do, but every little bit can help. Mm -hmm. On the peroxide? Yeah. Um, well, I, if you buy any of the commercial work, it's like um, just to stop sharing. You're involved with the brand, the rock today. Okay. That's all it works. You know, one, one to one to one hundred on an injector works okay. Um, yeah, you know, and it, it ends up being about the same strength as, as the pharmaceutical bottle would be. Yeah, you know, stuff's not too strong. Oh, you can still take questions. We're just preparing. Yeah. So, some other hands. You mentioned flowers get better when you uh, when you have more mature things. What are some cues of maturity? Like, what would you consider mature? Like, are they more weak? Are they being are they more roots? Well, uh, you know, a lot of it is you know, plant size. You know, I mean, you, you can kind of tell if your plants are just air stepping in growth, and you're you're going to hit a maximum at some point when once they're going the other direction. Um, then you know you have to get a root system back on them generally. But you know, like right. My Chilorianas are bigger than anybody's Chilorianas is all in my because I would happen to live in like the perfect spot for growing that species. Um, so I, you know, I know they're never going to get any bigger than an 18 inch size plant, and, and then you can start telling the size of that plant. Ten flowers on the Chilorianas, you can say, okay, it's not going to be much better than this. So, Yeah, just a little bit more room for improvement, but not much. <laughs> and some of this is you know, you can't even repot her without killing. So, if I've got them in 10 gallon buckets now, I don't want to mess with them. I don't want to mess with them. I have room. I'm all Yeah. How precise do you were tested in flowering, for example, like? 
it's going to flower five, it's going to flower ten, it's going to flower at what time, um, based on your experience. Uh, so I guess you know, get a get a program like look at this if you can, and just look at the the data it can give you because it'll you, know, you can pull up like out of the things that have been awarded, what's the what's the average flower count, what's the maximum flower count, and uh, you can kind of just figure it out from from statistic uh, or or experience. You know, I've, much of what I know is really from just being in the business since I was 20 years old. I I dropped out of college because I wasn't going to learn how to grow orchids in school. You know, by working with orchid growers and around orchid people, that's how I was going to learn how to grow orchids. Um, orchid business is great, but yeah, it's, it's experience, databases, and and if you if you just hang around the judges, even if you don't want to become a judge or or like the judges, uh, they're usually extremely knowledgeable people. And I, I, I was called an interlocutor for about a day because I didn't want to join the program, but I love being around these guys that knew their stuff, hearing them talk about angels on the head of a pin. Learn a lot. We like to learn. Yeah, you can learn a lot. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you could comment on like growing, particularly like specimen plants. I mean, Catley is typically, you know, most people get it to four, five, six uh, bulbs, and then you're like, okay, I need to repot it or not repot it, and there's always that that sort of back and forth of, hey, if I want to get it to a certain size, you lead, you're rotting the roots, and then you set it back, and you divide it, and you kind of repeat that. So I'm wondering, some of your plants were really much, much larger. What do you think is the secret to growing a really nice specimen plant that's like a big cat leader like that? Uh, <clears throat> That's a tough question because I don't grow a whole lot of specimens unless they're just really finicky plants that I don't want to mess with. Um, and really, my secrets on that is, is I just don't mess with them. If it's got to go into a larger container. I would, I, if I can get the container that it's in off, I'll pull it off. But if the roots are engulfing the pot that it's in, I'll leave it alone and just set it in something bigger. And wedge it in with chunks of styrofoam or other plastic pots or whatever, but I kind of quit repotting and just step them up. So, I mean, my amethyst glasses are literally in like 10 gallon pots um, because if I tried to do anything with them, this would buy. Mm -hmm. um, but you're, you're, not, you're not like throwing back in, you know half inch bark behind them to do that. You're putting now, in creepy they, bigger things behind them. Once they've got that kind of size, yeah. they're going to be able to survive just on the root system yeah. that they're, they've got that's you know, feeding off of humidity and watering once a week. Um, you know, for unifoliates, there are things that I do want to chop up or get rid of the middle of at times. Um, I generally don't grow those into specimens because I I'd rather not waste the space on a plant. If I can grow 10 plants in a section, I'd rather have 10 plants in a section. So if I am cutting back from being a specimen grower, I still always try to keep five bulbs. As Most people say, oh, let's start over with three. If you're starting over with three, you're starting over three years behind. If you start with a five bulb division and try to have some roots left on that, you can almost just keep cruising along without missing a beat. If that answers your question. Yeah, so, no, it's, I, I always think that that's the, that's the dynamic of you're like, this plant is growing great and it's blooming beautifully and I really should repot it, but it's a huge pain. And then, you know, you regret not repotting it because then you just waited too long and you kind of nuke the roots and then you really set it back. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm looking at- I'm, I'm looking for the solution. I'm looking at a lot of bifolates that didn't get handled this year, that didn't get handled last year, and I'm just praying that I can wait until next year before they crash and burn because they haven't been they haven't been looked at or touched. It's not a good thing. Yeah. Show and tell. All right. <laughs> Show and tell. Thank you very much for your presentation. What was that? I'm sorry. I said thank you very much for your presentation. You're very welcome. Thank you. 
So starting off tonight, we're going to start off with leading into, we had a big talk for Catalina. So let's start off with our first Catalina of the night for show and tell. Dave Furmeyer brings in Catalina, Alba, uh, Catalina Intermedia, Forma Alba, Pine Knot. Um, note that I, I don't know where Pine Knot came in as a cultivar, but this does not exhibit the typical form of an intermedia. There is one called Penn Valley, which is now known not to be a true intermedia. So uh, they very interesting plan. I'd like to hear them more about it in the future, but uh, this is an intermedia that may not be an intermedia. It must be an intermedia, but it's still a beautiful flower. Next, we have Dave's uh, staying with the Catlias. We have uh, BLC Black Forest Dark Thunder. Uh, Puma by Esther. So Esther is a big BLC. Puma brought it down. It's a beautiful little thing growing on a small plant. Big flower. Beautiful. Uh, next, we have Jan Anderson's Lelia X Campaniana. So this is the natural hybrid between Campaniana being one of the natural big ceruleans with the backbone of many of these. Um, uh, for big, per, big blue catlias, this is now the natural hybrid. If you see the X in front of it, it means it was found in nature and not the one man's made. So you don't think it's a natural hybrid? It's not natural. It's cross. Cross. Yeah, but it's not natural. Okay. Let's see. Keep going. Uh, next, we have uh, Jan Anderson. Um, can somebody close the door, please? Yeah. And someone appears to be having a drag race outside in San Francisco. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, next, we have Jan Anderson's uh, her, um, a Poltonara Learn. Martin, Martin Orange Light. So that's Dior by Mountain. Beautiful big yellow with a red lip standard cat layout. Yeah. Go pull Panara. Yeah. Pandanara. Then we next we have Dan Anderson's Rio Irene. Moana. Uh Oconi by um Sally Taylor. Oconi a big fin uh, Vinicolor burgundy is extremely dominant in its hybrid, so this looks a lot like Oconee, but it does seem to have a much improved form than Oconee. So very nice jam. It's a, yeah. Yeah, Pony can be six, seven inches. But, so the size does carry over into its progeny. Next, we have Doug Hunter's Yoto Ito, Volcano Queen. Volcano Queen comes uh, from one orchid nursery in Hawaii where he names everything after Volcano Queen, because he lives in the shadow of the volcano. Um, is that Atsuka? Atsuka, yes. Atsuka does everything in Volcano Queen, because uh, at least how I've heard the story is decades ago, there was, a, there was a volcano eruption and everyone burned around him except for him. So he thanks the volcano god for not burning his earth yeah, down. Like he's very so he's very good. Yeah, so so he thanks Madame Pele for not burning down his orchid stock. So we, yeah. And this is uh, ben, Benzino Treasure by Mount Hood. So Mount Hood being a beautiful pink or a white. So keep that. Uh, Volcano Island Volcano Queen also from Doug Hunter. A beautiful, a dark uh, art shade color. Next we have Jeff Harris's Key Lime Stars, a very nice one. Um, this is a ubiquitous cross. They've all come out looking like this. They're all equal, and many of them have gotten awarded, including I got one of my awarded myself. So if you're looking for something to get awarded, um, um, get one of these. And now that I have an awarded one, if, you, if anyone wants to help me assemble 12, 11 more of them to get an AQ, I will be doing that one of these days, whenever the lines when Violet Moon comes into bloom again. And next we have one of the more awesome, you have Patty Bush, uh, Prostechia Rando. Radii Coesii, so I believe that makes Green Hornet. So that now makes Green Hornet, it's the actual name of that cross. Beautiful, sequential, blooming, heavily fragrant, blooms this time of year, can, put, can 
mature plants. As we talk about maturity, first blooming, someone mentioned maturity can be in bloom for a little bit of month. Mature plants can be in bloom 18 months out of 18 months in fluorescence, nine to 18 months once it gets fully mature. So if you want to grow a plant up for maturity, who wasn't one an orchid blooming for a year and a half straight? And they bloom every year. So that's one of those ones that once you get it big enough, it will never be out of bloom for as long as you live in your natural life. <laughs> you live in your natural life. Next, moving into another genera, we have uh, Brassia Naldelli from Philistillus. Please, sorry. A beautiful, um, this, so this is what happens when you take the Brazilian Miltonias. This is pretty much having all the big genera. So that has an Oncitini, an Odonoglossum, a Miltoniopsis, and a Miltonia in it, and a Brassia. So that's five different genera in the background of it, which makes it uh, very much can take as much abuse as you can give it. Much abuse as you can get. Oh. Uh, and then we have, um, well, this comes from Phyllis Dietz. Uh, this is, we believe it's an intergeneric Toma Glacier. I don't believe it's, act, it, it may not be from the form of Toma Glacier, but that was one of the, Toma Glacier itself is one of the most uh, famous. Uh, uh, that was the one that started all of this. So all the, almost all of the, BLRs have Toma Glacier in the background of it, and it's very dominant for form. And we have one of the species of behind it, Brachii from Jeff Harris. The album one, very nice. I believe you got that from uh, number plant sales, correct? This one piece there. Andes, okay. There was one on sale there right there. And then we have one of a case, uh, Renicris now Gomesa. Um, so this is now one of what we consider one of the small equitant on Sydneyums. So really somehow related somewhat to the uh to the Columbians. Yes. They will they will breed with the Columbians, but they will not breed with the rest of the on Sydney. Next we have um, moving over to the some of the other South American genera. We have K crumbs maxillaria, um Birch. Spurgii, yeah. native to Venezuela, three inch flowers, um, and it has a very nice strong stem away from the flower, which is very nice for this species because some of the maxillaries can be very close to the bottom of the pot. So nice species, well grown, thank you, Kay. And next we have um, Dave Furmeyers again, staying in the maxillary family, one of the ones, one of the tribes is the Zygo tribe. And this is Sinusure, so this is an Aceus a plant that is satan satanic to grow. If you talk about plants that are hard to grow, there's nothing harder than an Aceus But if you give it one shot of Zygo, it actually can live. So this, but it gives you that blue color. So this is some of the, uh, this is still only one generation of move from an Aceus That's that pollen on the pot. So now we're getting two, three generations back. So now you can have even better blues that are easier to grow. Yeah, some of this um, next, you know, talking about last month, we had some, we had a great talk from Alan Hawk on Ingrakoids. So this shows Roberta Foxes. Uh, this is a member of the Ingrakoid tribe. Uh, I do not know how to spell. Ceratochylus spiglegulosus. Yes, thank you. The, the name is bigger than the plant. <laughs> That's a true statement. A native to Java, cooler, uh, warmer growing as most of the ingrakums do, but it apparently grows well for Roberta even in colder temperatures there in a small flower on a very small plant as Roberta's hand can be used as a reference. It's a few thousand meters, yeah. And then we get um, one of the leafless orchids. So these ones have no leaves. They're just a ball of roots. We talk about root care again in the ingrakums. Photosynthesize, as we learned last month from their roots. This shows why, that they don't need any leaves at all. They can completely get all their necessation. Not probably, a Roberta is one of our more, more advanced growers. So maybe not a plan to try your first time around. Um, Cause they do, because without leaves, they do not need, they need a lot of humidity, um, but this is, and it's a warmer, Growing species, so it likes to be warm, warm, hot, and dry. Uh, I don't, you know, don't tell my plant it grows outside, forty degrees, you know, down to forty, and so in the winter. Yeah. 
Go play it. And list one of the orange ones, too. Uh, next, we stay with uh, Ralph's uh, Dendrobium um, Melformium. Uh, this is one of the Dendrobiums that are reed stems native to Japan. So this is one of the rare Dendrobiums that are native to Japan. Um, I like and it has extremely dark leaves. And this is one of those reed stem Dendrobiums. So they call them the hard stem Dendrobiums. Right now, as we're throughout now until about March, those leaves will go completely deciduous. They will they will go completely leafless this time of year. And as they come out of dormancy, you'll see little buds. Those are the flowers. Do not water them until the flowers are done, until the flowers are coming out, or you have a dead plant. So just a cultural point, if you have one of those hard reed stem dendrobiums, if they're go some of them, like Parishii, are going into dormancy now, they go into dormancy, some come out of dormancy now, some of them go into dormancy. Don't mind if they start losing their leaves. Be fine and wait till spring. And don't kill your plants. Don't kill your plants. That goes with King Yanum too. They don't go to Sidious, but they are running their winter rest now. Yes, you'll make more cakeys yeah, and you won't get any flowers. Yes. Dendrobium little green. So that's Dendrobium golden elf by um uh Kung Kavicorum. Sorry, I've never pronounced that one well. Um, this is probably a Roy Takanawa cross because this is the type of stuff he loved to do. A uh, beautiful little flower here, dark lipped, probably heavily fragrant as well. And these are smaller growing species. And next we have uh, 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 Sologeny milleri from K. Crumb. This seems to be the white one. Uh, these can be pendulous. These are pendulous thing down inflorescences that are sequential blooming. Some of them are, some of them are not sequential blooming. As K, is this a sequential bloomer or not a sequential bloomer? Um, there are two uh, kind of spent flowers on that one stem. I don't really know. This is the first time it's bloomed for me, so I'm not that familiar. Yeah. There is, that's a yardstick in the back. You can see how big the plant is. Yeah. It's a very large plant. They do get quite large. These things can be massive. And here we see another um, Xrensis. This is the one that has been that a lot of people have been getting because it has this beautiful chocolate brown coloring and has heavily fragrance too. I think personally, to me, it's a little chocolatey too. So isn't it great just to have a chocolate bar orchid? Um, so how do you pronounce the species? Uh, I got the uh, and then we have Jeff Harris's. Now this is one of the South American genera that um, that is also related to the, um, this is actually related to the selogeny, but I have no idea what it is. Jeff, you wanna give a little five second talk about it? Oh, really? Yeah. Really? And it's on the table, it's really big, it has a big, um, um, starts kind of this lavender yeah. and they're evergreen they're evergreen they're evergreen. They're, 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 they're not just evergreen. Uh, I didn't have one <laughs> but maybe it's uh, only deciduous at their day but it's on the table you will we'll see it when we'll see it in person when we go in there and then we have Judy's um Phalaenopsis minimark. So this is now some of those new, these are some of the new um, African phalaenopsins that are ultra miniature. We're talking pint size, like palm of your hand size, totally mature plants. So these are now being bred into the standard fails to make these beautiful little miniature things. It's cute, very cute, white with orange spots. That's and cute. A lot of interesting flowers. A lot of interesting flowers and a lot of interesting forms as well that you're not seeing in the grocery store fails. And we already saw this one before. And, and then we have Roberta Fox's Semberkia. Semberkias have been, they're finding new species pretty much here. That's a Sobralia. 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 <laughs> Sobralia. Sobralia um, they're finding new species of these pretty much every day in Ecuador. And so if you get one, we're talking about awards. There's also a category for botanical. If you're the first one to ever bring in a species. So if you get a lot of these, I... Bought one at a show at TRXQS that 
now got a, that we'll get a botanical award next year. Didn't have any flowers this year, but it's never been shown. So that's an easy way also. So if you like to get the awards, be the first one to have something. And then we have um, Patty uh, Stanhopia Elmeri. This is the beautiful white one. Uh, these flowers only last for a few days, so I bet the flowers are already faded because they only last three to five days, but they sound like a gunflower going off and they will fill your entire greenhouse with fragrance. That is the um, Stanhopias. And that's the end. So we're going to go now to Jeff has, or is this? Yeah, oh. To catch up, so. Okay. Got it. So this is my um, Mary Elizabeth Ron Royal Flame. This is the cerulean form of that, half Brangiana. This is uh, my, uh, this is also mine. Uh, this is uh, one of the plants we have for the raffle table tonight, but I got one from Ben as we were visiting today. This is a newer species. This is tennis. Related to bicolor, but only discovered in 1987 and wasn't available in the U.S. until the early 80s, the early 2000s, actually. So this is one of the newer species of bipolates. What is its name? This is the Cataleya tenus. Tenuous. Tenus. T-E-N-U-I. You're asking the autistic how to spell? That's not a very good question to ask. That's never a good question to ask. That's never a good question to ask. That's never a good question to ask. Oh, I, 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 I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. And we'll go to Jeff. Do you want me to stay clicking through here or? Yeah, you just keep clicking. I don't know why the. So, from my detection, I'm hearing some kind of sound. Yeah. So then we have some. Do you want me to read them all? Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh, and I'll pick them up from here so we can, or we can, I can play my best day on a white. Refresh the deck. Refresh the deck. Refresh. I think you might have to stop the show. And uh, let's, Jeff, let's, let's just paint. Okay. Let's stop. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so we, we're having some technical difficulties. We'll show the ones for the people in the room. Uh, Zoom folks, we thank you for being on, and we'll see you next month.